Altair's story is probably the most consequential and, in my opinion, compelling in the entire series. Though as it stands, his story is spread out over not just AC1 and Revelations, but a book side games, comics, and codex pages. And so I thought I'd try to piece together all of the important stuff and tell his story in one cohesive, chronological video with the Secret Crusade at the center. This is going to be a long one, so I've split this up using YouTube's time coding feature. Also, a lot of this stuff is exclusive to the novel, so that's why I've kind of had to edit around a lack of gameplay for some stuff, and I hope that's okay. Anyway, with all that said, I hope you guys enjoy. Saladin's forces marched onward. His Saracen army dwarfed the assassins in number, an advantage he intended to use to crush Masyaf, the assassin base of operations. It wasn't a huge fortress, but certainly a well-placed one, isolated in the mountains of western Syria. The assassins had made two attempts on Saladin's life previously, and he seeked to prevent a third with an all-out attack. The Saracens attacked with rams, arrows, and siege engines, but ultimately the assassins had the high ground in the greater arches, and so the Saracens were forced to fall back. In the morning, Saladin's uncle, Shihab, was sent to speak with Al-Walim, the master of the Assassins. Shihab told him that the Saracens would leave on the conditions that they had the head of the Assassin, Umar, who several hours earlier had snuck into Saladin's quarters, leaving him a letter pinned to a pallet by dagger, demonstrating just how easily the Assassins could kill him if they so pleased. On his way out, Umar was confronted by one of Saladin's generals, resulting in his death. For this, the Saracens wanted Umar's life. Umar was initially willing to sacrifice his life in order to ensure peace, to Amalim's resistance. Once Shihab revealed he had another assassin spy, Ahmad, in captivity, who would surely be executed only for the war to continue, this became a question of honour. And so both Umar and Al-Mualim agreed to the execution, with Umar only asking that Al-Mualim raise and train his son, Altair. And so bound by duty, Umar knelt over the chopping block. A ten-year-old Altair watched the executioner raise his scimitar and... <laughs> Ahmad was returned to the assassins racked with guilt, unable to accept that not only had he ensured the death of his brother, but he had made his son, the same age as his own, an orphan. Altair was furious. He despised Ahmad for killing his father, but not as much as Ahmad hated himself. An intense shame that soon wore his sanity thin. One night, Altair heard Ahmad in the courtyard madly screaming Umar's name, as Ahmad's own son, Abbas, watched in horror. Days later, Ahmad entered Altair's room as he slept, apologizing to the boy before slitting his own throat. Horrified, Altair ran to Al Mualim's quarters, who reassured him that all would be okay. In the absence of Umar and his mother, who had died in childbirth, Al-Mualim became the closest thing that Altair had to a parent. Though he was well aware that his love was often strategic and not exactly real, it was something, and he had little, if anything, else. The day after Ahmad's death, Al-Mualim initiated both Altair and Abbas as novices, with Abbas and the rest of the Brotherhood under the pretense that Ahmad had simply left without notice, allowing them to come to their own conclusions. And from here on out, Altair and Abbas were to be brothers, and they truly were in more than name. Their days consisted of rigorous training and lectures, the majority of each being spent together, and so Abbas quickly became Altair's closest friend, learning, laughing, and growing together. But as weeks, months, and years ebbed away, so did Abbas's belief that his father would return, slowly embittering and consuming him. Altair thought that he owed it to his friend to tell him how his father died, that maybe some closure would grant him some peace of mind. But upon telling Abbas there was no screaming or crying, as he had anticipated, he only turned in his bed and left Altair in excruciating silence. In the morning, the two trained in the quadrangle, with Abbas electing to graduate to steel after years of using sparring swords, and soon it became clear why. Abbas fought with lethal intention, nicking Altair as the two contended over the true nature of Ahmad's death. A sympathetic Altair insisted that he was being entirely truthful and that he only wanted to relieve Abbas as he swerved his deadly strikes and gave none back. All the while, a curious Al-Mualim studied the two from his tower, only interrupting as Abbas held a knife to Altair's throat, at which point Altair had no choice but to concede. As punishment, the two spent a month in the dungeons, with Abbas forced to spend an additional year in training. A perceived injustice that only made his resentment for Altair and the Brotherhood grow stronger. Over the next decade, Altair only continued to excel. He viewed Abbas as a hateful and, above all, a pathetic man, firmly beneath him and his growing list of accomplishments, the greatest of which 
came in 1189, when Harris, an assassin traitor, led a Templar army into Masia, where he held Al Mualim hostage. He was saved by a 24-year-old Altair, who was elevated to Master Assassin soon after, the youngest ever. From there on, Altair was entrusted with some of the Assassin's most important missions. The next year, Altair was sent to retrieve the Chalice, a so-called artifact that wasn't actually an object, but a woman named Ada, a living power source that was the closest thing to a living piece of Eden. Her and Altair became romantically involved before she was tragically killed by the Basilisk, the leader of a group of crusaders who also sought out the chalice. I'm gonna be honest there, this is from Altair's Chronicles, and this is about as much depth as there is to give this, and I would go into it more if there was more here that's of interest. The game was omitted from the Secret Crusade entirely, unlike Bloodlines, which is also a side game because it just doesn't really have a lot going on narratively. It's very bare bones and largely doesn't matter. It's a series of events suited to a series of missions and not the other way around. It, it just doesn't really add much and would make this video 30 minutes longer for nothing really. And that's why I'm kind of just skimming over it. The only really important takeaway from Chronicles, which ironically was added in the Codex in AC2, is that after Adder's death, Altair is just done with, with love, basically. He is heartbroken and doesn't really expect to ever feel for anyone the same way that he did for her. Anyway, back to it. Having been instructed to retrieve an undisclosed but important treasure by Al Mualim, Altair, Malik, and his brother Kadar stole through the tunnels beneath the Temple of Solomon. Altair had been a master assassin for some time, and in ability, at least, that was a very fitting title, a fact that made him incredibly overconfident. Upon finding a Templar priest praying in the temple, Altair killed the man simply because he stood in their way, much to the dismay of Malik, whose discretion and obedience Altair mistook for cowardice. Further along, inside the chamber, the assassin spotted a group of knights. At its centre was a man who could easily be recognised, with his distinctive French accent and cape, Templar Grandmaster Robert de Saab. Altair forfeited the advantage of obscurity, confronting the man head on. He tried to converse with de Saab to get the measure of him, but this was no use. De Saab caught Altair's attack and held him paralysed. Altair was in complete disbelief that he'd been bettered. In that moment, he felt like a weak child. Before discarding him as such, de Saab gave Altair a message. The Crusaders intend to take the Holy Land, and the Assassins would be wise to flee. Stay, and all of you will die. After a five-day journey, Altair returned to Masyaf, to Al Mualim, to be thoroughly scolded for his critical failure. During this reprimanding, Malik, who both assumed to be dead, entered the room, holding his bloodied, battered arm with the other. What little energy Malik had left was channeled into rage, an agonizing embarrassment for Altair that only worsened when Malik revealed that he had secured the treasure. He, who was so much lesser than Altair. None of them had time to lay eyes on the contents of the glowing box that housed the treasure. Malik had been trailed by an army of crusaders, led by Robert. By second nature, Altair entered the fray, cutting through Christians with zero concern for his own life. He even contemplated if it was better to die now with some honour than to suffer the consequences of his actions. In spite of his preoccupation, he fought viciously and masterfully. In a strategy unknown to Altair, Raoul fled him and another assassin to Masyaf's highest tower, performing a leap of faith on Q, convincing the Crusaders that they had jumped to their deaths, fearless and dedicated. Under the pretense of his death, Altair released a bundle of logs on the Crusaders, forcing them to fall back. Al Mualim's discretion planted some serious seeds of doubt in Altair's mind. If he didn't tell Altair about Masyaf's defensive strategy, what else had he kept secret? Maybe all this time he had simply been Al Mualim's sharpest tool. Altair's time of reflection was cut short as all of the assassins met in the courtyard. Al Mualim summoned Altair to the front, congratulating him on his success before having two assassins restrain him. He berated Altair in front of all of his peers, reminding him of the three tenets of the assassin's creed. Stay your blade from the flesh of an innocent, hide in plain sight, and never compromise the Brotherhood. Altair had broken all three. A selfish act beneath Jerusalem placed us all in danger. Worse still, you brought the enemy to our home. Every man we've lost today was lost because of you. I am sorry. Truly I am. But I cannot abide a traitor. I am not a traitor. 
Your actions indicate otherwise. And so you leave me no choice. Peace be upon you, Altair. Altair regained consciousness in Al Mualim's study, stripped of both his weapons and rank. If he was to get them back and truly redeem himself, he'd have to kill a list of men for Al Mualim. Men that he only described as plague makers and war bringers. The first of which was Tamir a black market merchant operating in Damascus, a Saracen-controlled city. Altair found working as an assassin again to be an exhilarating experience. Slipping through crowds and leaping across rooftops had never been so satisfying. He was glad to be an assassin again, humbled and stripped of all complacency. From atop a high point in the city, Altair located the Damascus Assassin Bureau. These locations served as the heart of assassin intelligence within their respective cities, as well as a safe house for any wandering assassins. Altair entered through the only available entrance, the rooftop, and spoke to the Rafiq who occupied the bureau. The Rafiq condescended Altair, who was now his inferior, a fact that he wasn't eager to let Altair forget. And that fleeting moment of real joy quickly dissipated as he was made acutely aware of his newfound position. A novice back at the bottom of the ladder. And so Altair left the bureau back to his old, jaded self, headed for the souk where he had begun to investigate Tamir. Some merchants gathered in the centre of the poor district. They made mention of some deal with Tamir, the biggest yet, though they dispersed before revealing anything incriminating. In the square, Altair observed several wine caskets being wheeled to the home of Abul Nakot, but this wasn't his focus, and so he averted his attention to a shadowy orator, spouting blatant propaganda about Tamir. He told a tale about how Tamir had stumbled upon Saladin's forces prior to the Battle of Hattin. Saladin's men were tired and hungry, and Tamir, being a generous benefactor to the Saracen cause, happily donated his wares and his food supply, surely contributing to his decisive victory over the Crusaders that day. After stalking and beating the orator, Altair managed to get some information about his employer. Tamir was set to meet with a member of Damascus's merchant guild. Following this lead, Altair observed a dispute between the two, rising from Tamir's ludicrous demands of the guild, escalating to Tamir stabbing the merchant to death as guards simply watched on. As Tamir lost himself again berating his other merchants, Altair seized the moment. Be at peace. You'll pay for this. You and all your kind. It seems you're the one pays now, my friend. You'll not profit from suffering any longer. You think me some petty death dealer, suckling at the breast of war? A strange target, don't you think? Why me, when so many others do the same? You believe yourself different, then. Oh, but I am. For I serve a far nobler cause than mere profit. Just like my brothers. Brothers? Ah, but he thinks I act alone. I am but a piece. A man with a part to play. You'll come to know the others soon enough. They won't take kindly to what you've done. Good. I look forward to ending their lives as well. Such pride. It will destroy you, child. Altair's next target operated in Acre. On his journey, Altair reflected on the siege that had won the Crusaders control of it just a year prior. The Templars planned to poison the city's water supply, killing the population. Altair thwarted this strategy, but still, the siege was brutal, resulting in mass starvation, disease, and the execution of 3,000 Muslim hostages by William de Moffrat. This left Acre a depressive, battle-worn city, a city whose suffering Altair's next target capitalised on. Garnier de Naples was Grand Master of the Knights Hospitella, an organisation founded a century previous after the First Crusade. Their goal was to aid sick and injured Christian pilgrims, as their job was naturally a dangerous one. Young recruits were taught to be effectively combat medics of their time. By the time of the Third Crusade, the Hospitella were officially a military organisation, large enough to cause serious problems for the Saracens. Garnier had been exiled from his native France for conducting inhumane experiments on his patients. Given his family's significant contributions to Richard's cause, he was taken in by the Christians and given his current position. And as Grand Master, his bizarre experiments continued, though not out of sadism or spite, but a genuine, albeit warped belief that he was helping these people and making genuine medical innovations. It was a prospect that sickened Altair, and inside the hospital, he saw Garnier's brutality for himself, but also 
this earnest desire to help these people, which Garnier elaborated on after being apprehended. Let go, your burden. Ah, alas, now, yes. The endless dream calls to me. But before I close my eyes, I must know what will become of my children. You mean the people made to suffer your cruel experiments? They'll be free now to return to their homes. Homes? What homes? The sewers? The portals? The prisons that we dragged them from? You took these people against their will. Yes. What little will there was for them to have. Are you really so naive? Do you appease a kind child simply because he wills? But I want to play with fire, father. What would you say? As you wish. Ah. But then you'd answer for his burn. These are not children, but men and women full grown. In body, perhaps, but not in mind. Which is the very damage I sought to repair. I admit, without the piece of Eden, which you stole from us, my progress was slowed. But there are herbs, mixtures and extracts. My guards are proof of this. They were madmen before I found and freed them from the prisons of their own minds. <sighs> and with my death, madmen they will be again. You truly believe you were helping them? It's not what I believe. It's what I know. Altair's next target was Talal, a human trafficker based in Jerusalem. A fact that Altair resented as the Rafiq of Jerusalem's bureau was Malik, whose arm was now amputated. A sobering image that humbled and ashamed Altair, who tolerated and even agreed with Malik's contempt that he had no problem vocalising when Altair arrived. After some investigation, Altair found enslaved citizens caged and malnourished in Talal's warehouse. As it turned out, these slaves weren't being held captive with the intent of being trafficked, but saved. In the mind of Talal, these were delinquents. Beggars, prostitutes, lepers, and addicts that needed saving. Upon being stopped by Altair, he spoke of an organisation separate to Crusaders and Saracens, much like Tamir had. You've nowhere to run now. Share your secrets with me. My part is plain. The Brotherhood is not so weak that my death will stop its work. What Brotherhood? Al-Mu'alim is not the only one with designs upon the Holy Land. And that's all you'll have from me. Then we are finished. Beg forgiveness from your god. He's long abandoned us. Long abandoned the men and women I took into my arms. What do you mean? Beggars, whores, addicts, lepers. Do they strike you as proper slaves? Unfit for even the most menial tasks? No. I took them not to sell, but to save. And yet you'd kill us all. For no other reason. Then it was asked of you. No, you profit from the war, from lives lost and broken. Yes, you would think that, ignorant as you are. Wall off your mind. They say it's what your kind do best. Do you see the irony in all this? No, not yet, it seems. But you will. Returning to Masyaf, Altair was glad to see that he'd began to regain some lost respect amongst Al-Mualim and the other assassins. He had called three despicable major targets, with three more now designated to suffer the same fate. Abul Nakad, the wealthiest man in the Damas, Majadin, regent of Jerusalem, and William of Morferat, the next target Altair would take on. William's place was currently as liege lord of Acre in the stead of King Richard, who had been busy warring. Upon arrival, it became blatantly clear that William was abhorred by both his own men and townsfolk. William had effectively been given his position in order to prevent William's son, Conrad, from rebelling against Richard, as his father was now a pseudo-hostage living amongst crusaders. Altair discovered that Richard intended to meet and reprimand William for his incredibly poor leadership, an act he made publicly, berating William for his cruelty, the mass execution he'd committed in Acre specifically. Richard had planned to trade the lives of the captured Muslims in return for the lives of Christians that Salah ad-Din had captured, and William's mass execution had not only obstructed that plan, 
but made the Saracens more sure of their cause. Altair tailed a brooding William back to his fortress, being wary of his guard and mindful not to repeat past mistakes. After rebuking some of his men and making an example of two for whoring and drinking, he made his way back to his own quarters where Altair had the chance to take his life. Rest now. Your schemes are at an end. What do you know of my work? I know that you are going to murder Richard and claim Akka for your son Conrad. <laughs> for Conrad? My son is an arse, unfit to lead his host, let alone a kingdom. And Richard, the only know is no better, blinded as he is by faith in the insubstantial. Akra does not belong to either of them. Then who? The city belongs to its people. How can you claim to speak for the citizens? You stole their food, disciplined them without mercy, forced them into service under you. Everything I did, I did to prepare them for the new world. Stole their food? No. I took possession so that when the lean times came, it might be rationed properly. <coughs> Look around. My district is without crime, save those committed by you and your ilk. And as for the conscription, they were not being trained to fight. They were being taught the merits of order and discipline. These things are hardly evil. No matter how noble you believe your intentions, these acts are cruel and cannot continue. <laughs> we'll see how sweet they are, the fruits of your labors. You do not free the cities as you believe, but rather damn them. And in the end, you'll have only yourself to blame. You, who speak of good intentions. At this point it was blatant that something bound the four men that Altair had killed, something he was sure Al-Mualim was at the very least aware of. Though pressing Al-Mualim gave Altair zero answers, as Al-Mualim insisted that Altair simply had trust in him and that he subdued those thoughts. In Damascus, Altair hunted Abul Nakod, the Merchant King, a man despised by the populace in part for his disgusting, ostentatious image, but also for his embezzling of public funds, much of which he funneled to William. Investigating Abul, Altair was distracted by a speaker. He demanded the books of the people in order to be burnt. It was concerning, but not something that could knock Altair, who had just discovered that Abul was hosting a party that night, and that there was a scaffolding stood outside his balcony that could be used to make an entrance. Abul introduced himself and to Altair's surprise, the civilians that derided Abul didn't exaggerate. This was an obese, gaudy, obscene man who spat vitriol with food in his teeth. As he began to speak, wine caskets were wheeled in. Abul insisted that the attendants drank the wine, and as he continued to speak, all those drinking began to cough and stumble and fall. Abul scorned his dying guests for disparaging him at every turn, for turning him into a morbid, sick joke. Archers were now posted on the rooftops, drawing their bows to shoot down all those who didn't drink. And as they drew, Altair made a beeline for the balcony and put an end to Nakon. Be at peace now. Their words can no longer do harm. Why have you done this? You stole money from those you claim to lead. Sent it away for some unknown purpose. I want to know where it's gone and why. Look at me. My very nature is an affront to the people I ruled. And these noble robes did little more than to muffle their shouts of hate. So this is about vengeance then? No, not vengeance, but my conscience. How could I finance a war in service to the same god that calls me an abomination? If you do not serve Salah ad dins cause, then whose? In time, you'll come to know them. I think perhaps you already do. Then why hide? And why these dark deeds? Is it so different from your own work? You take the lives of men and women, strong in the conviction that their deaths will improve the lots of those left behind. A minor evil for a greater good? We are the same. No. We are nothing alike. Ah, but I see it in your eyes. You doubt. You cannot stop us. We will have our new world. Frustrated, Altair returned demanding answers from Al Mualim, who looked hard at him. No, really, he did. And after some serious contention, Al Mualim confessed. These men were indeed connected unified under the Knights Templar. 
Each man I'm sent to kill speaks cryptic words to me. Each time I come to you and ask for answers. Each time you give only riddles in exchange. But no more. Who are you to say no more? I'm the one who does the killing. If you want it to continue, you'll speak straight with me for once. Tread carefully, boy. I do not like your tone. And I do not like your deception. I have offered you a chance to restore your lost honor. Not lost. Taken. By you. And then you've sent me to fetch it again like some damn dog. It seems I'll need to find another. A shame. You showed great potential. I think if you had another, you'd have sent him long ago. You said the answer to my question would arise when I no longer needed to ask it. So I will not ask. I demand you tell me what binds these men. Uh, what you say is true. These men are connected by a blood oath not unlike our own. Who are they? Non nobis, domine non nobis. Templars. Now you see the true reach of Robert de Sade. All of these men, leaders of cities, commanders of armies, all pledge allegiance to his cause. Their works are not meant to be viewed on their own, are they? But as a whole, what do they desire? Conquest. They seek the Holy Land not in the name of God, but for themselves. What of Richard? Salah Eddin? Any who oppose the Templars will be destroyed. Be assured they have the means to accomplish it. Then they must be stopped. That is why we do our work, Altair. To ensure a future free of such things. Why did you hide the truth from me? That you might pierce the veil yourself. Like any task, knowledge precedes action. Information learned is more valuable than information given. Besides, your behavior had not inspired much confidence. I see. Altair, your mission has not changed. Merely the context within which you perceive it. And armed with this knowledge, I might better understand those Templars that remain. Is there anything else you want to know? What about the treasure Malik retrieved from Solomon's temple? Robert seemed desperate to have it back. In time, Altair, all will become clear. Just as the role of the Templars has revealed itself to you, so too will the nature of their treasure. For now, take comfort in the fact that it is not in their hands, but ours. <sighs> this game is fucking awesome. His next target was Maj Eddin, Regent of Jerusalem. Malik gave Altair a time and a place, the execution plaza near the Wailing Wall. An assassin was set to be executed unless Altair could get to Maj, who personally served as both executioner and orator, spouting Saracen propaganda, justifying each of the executions he meant to commit, making grandiose examples of each of these four blasphemers. The prostitute, gambler, thief, and finally, the heretic, the assassin. Maj made examples of not only those he planned to execute, but each of the civilians that insulted him or showed any kind of dissent. Each murder was explained as a purging of communal sin. Altair made his way through the crowd and put an end to Maj, who readily admitted that killing was an act of empowerment for him, as it was, in a way, for Altair once before. The work here is finished. No, no, it had only just begun. Tell me, what's your part in all of this? Do you intend to defend yourself as the others have and explain away your evil deeds? The Brotherhood wanted the city. I wanted power. There was an opportunity. An opportunity to murder innocents. Not so innocent. Dissident voices cut deep as steel. They disrupt order. In this, I do agree with the Brotherhood. You'd kill people simply for believing differently than you. Of course not. I killed them because I could. Because it was fun. Do you know what it feels like to determine another man's fate? And did you see the way the people cheered? The way they feared me? I was like a god. You'd have done the same if you could. Such power. Once, perhaps. But then I learned what becomes of those who lift themselves above others. And what is that? Here, let me show you. Back in his study, Al Mualim explained that the cased artifact was the Peace of Eden. It was, as Al Mualim described it, 
temptation itself. A claim that would sound like metaphor were it not for the fact that the artifact practically dragged Altair's gaze to it. In contrast of its simple appearance, Al-Mualim told legends of its effect, the casting out of Adam and Eve, the parting of the Red Sea, and the turning of water into wine. It controlled men's minds absolutely, and as Al-Mualim explained, it would be endlessly more efficient than the man-made deceit that the Templars currently employed. What am I supposed to see? This piece of silver cast out Adam and Eve. It turned staves into snakes, parted and closed the Red Sea. Eris used it to start the Trojan War, and with it a poor carpenter turned water into wine. It seems rather plain for all the power you claim it has. How does it work? He who holds it commands the hearts and minds of whoever looks upon it. Whoever tastes of it, as they say. Then Gagne's men? An experiment. Herbs used to simulate its effects, to be ready for when they held it. Talel supplied them. To me, equipped them. They were preparing for something. But what? War. And the others, the men who ruled the cities, they meant to gather up their people, make them like Gagne's men. The perfect citizens, the perfect soldiers, a perfect world. Robert de Sable must never have this back. So long as he and his brothers live, they will try. Then they must be destroyed. Which is what I've had you do. It all made sense now. Each of the Templars played a part. Tamir would provide the supplies and the weapons. Abel would donate funds, and Talel did intend on trafficking the slaves. Not to a buyer, but to Garnier, who would use them as lab rats in an attempt to emulate the Peace of Eden's mind control. Finally, the leader of each major city would round up their citizens en masse, susceptible to the device's mind control. If the Templars took the Peace of Eden, then they would take the Holy Land with it. And after that, the world. Intent on ending their schemes, Altair set out to take another life and his enemies surely expected him by now. The fabled White Hood. In Damascus, Altair saw the book burnings in action. These mass burnings were meant to expel falsehoods, falsehoods that had infected the minds of the populace. Any dissenting scholars were killed, thrown into the fire. They had no place in the New World. The stories of an assassin purging the Templar Order had grown so pervasive that Jubayer had installed decoys to distract Altair, though to no luck. Altair took Jubayer's life who insisted the books were simply a source of outmoded ideals that only really served to accelerate division and conflict. Why? Why? Why have you done this? Men must be free to do what they believe. It is not our right to punish one for thinking what they do, no matter how much we disagree. Then what? You of all people should know the answer. Educate them. Teach them right from wrong. It must be knowledge that frees them, not force. They do not learn, fixed in their ways as they are. You are naive to think otherwise. It's an illness for which there is but one cure. You're wrong, and that's why you must be put to rest. Am I not unlike those precious books you seek to save? A source of knowledge with which you disagree, yet you are rather quick to steal my life. A small sacrifice to save many. It is necessary. Is it not ancient scrolls that inspire the Crusaders? That fill Salah ad and his men with a sense of righteous fury? Their texts endanger others, bring death in their wake. I too was making a small sacrifice. It matters little now. Your deed is done. And so am I. Only one target left before Robert de Saab was truly vulnerable, and Walim saw it fit to reinstate Altair's rank as master. He now displayed a true understanding of what it means to be an assassin, and how the Templar cause directly opposes their most important values. Before you go, I have a question for you. Of course. What is the truth? We place faith in ourselves. We see the world the way it really is, and hope that one day all mankind might see the same. What is the world, then? An illusion. One which we can either submit to, as most do, or transcend. What is it to transcend? To recognize nothing is true and everything is permitted. That laws arise not from divinity but reason. I understand now that our creed does not command us to be free. It commands us to be wise. Do you see now why the Templars are a threat? Whereas we would dispel the illusion, they would use it to rule. Yes to reshape the world in an image more pleasing to them. That is why I sent you to steal their treasure. 
That is why I keep it locked away. And that is why you kill them. So long as even one survives, so too does their desire to create a new world order. His final target preceding Robert was Sibrand, Grand Master of the Knights Teutonic, a German Catholic military group aligned with the Crusaders. Sibrand had formed a blockade around the Aqueducts to prevent Richard's men from receiving supplies. Having seen seven of his brothers called, Sibrand was incredibly paranoid. He even went as far as to kill a priest who simply looked like an assassin. Still, Altair made short work of his defences and took Sibran's life. Like the other Templars, he expressed no faith in God, with his atheism only consolidated by the nature of the Peace of Eden. Please, don't do this. You are afraid. Of course I am afraid. But you'll be safe now, held in the arms of your God. Have my brothers taught you nothing? I know what waits for me. For all of us. If not your God, then what? Nothing. Nothing waits. And that is what I fear. You don't believe. How could I, given what I know? What I've seen? Our treasure was the proof. Proof of what? That this life is all we have. Linger a while longer, then, and tell me of the part you were to play. A blockade by sea. To keep the fool kings and queens from sending reinforcements. Once we... Once we... Conquered the Holy Land? Freed it, you fool. From the tyranny of faith. Freedom? You worked to overthrow cities, control men's minds, murdered any who spoke against you. I followed my orders, believing in my cause. Same as you. No one left to stand on his way. Al Mualim sent Altair to cross one last name off his list. Robert de Saab himself was due at the funeral of Maj Adin, where he would surely be vulnerable. On the road, Altair found himself reflecting on Abbas, on the days after revealing his father's fate, how Abbas had tried to kill him for his sympathy. Altair now recognised the day he was made master as the beginning of his great arrogance. Not because of his prestigious new title, but because Abbas had spat at his feet that day, and Altair had only sneered, planting the seeds of his once all-consuming pride and carelessness, faults that no longer plagued a wise and humbled man, a change that seemed to be felt even by Malik. True then. Robert de Sable is in Jerusalem. I've seen the knights myself. Only misfortune follows that man. If he's here, it's because he intends ill. I won't give him the chance to act. Do not let vengeance cloud your thoughts, brother. We both know no good can come of that. I have not forgotten. You have nothing to fear. I do not seek revenge, but knowledge. Truly, you are not the man I once knew. Fortune favor your blade, brother. Malik, before I go, there's something I should say. Be out with it. I've been a fool. Normally I'd make no argument, but what is this? What are you talking about? All this time, I never told you I was sorry. Too damn proud. You lost your arm because of me. Lost Qadr. You had every right to be angry. I do not accept your apology. I understand. No, you don't. I do not accept your apology because you are not the same man who went with me into Solomon's temple. And so you have nothing to apologize for. Malik. Perhaps if I had not been so envious of you, I would not have been so careless myself. I'm just as much to blame. Don't say such things. We are one. As we share the glory of our victories, so too should we share the pain of our defeat. In this way, we grow closer. We grow stronger. Thank you, brother. Rest if you need to, Altair, that you might be ready for what lies ahead. Maj's funeral was guarded by a disarmingly small number of Templar knights, with Robert only being guarded by two. As Altair slipped through a crowd of mourners, things only became more suspicious. Robert seemed shorter and slighter than when they had last encountered each other, and his cape was too long. Instinct demanded that Altair fleet, but before he could, the Imam announced the presence of the assassin who had killed Maj, back again to mock him with his presence. Altair had been baited. As the crowd opened around him, Templar and Saracen guards spilled in, each cut down with ease. Altair saved Robert's decoy for last, who it became clear was a woman, a fact that filled him with both amusement and admiration. He wondered what qualified her for such an important role. She fought bravely and with the competency of any other knight he'd combated with. Disarming the woman, the two spoke, and she explained the deceit. No sorcery. We knew you'd come. 
Robert needed to be sure he'd have time to get away. So he flees. We cannot deny your success. You have laid waste to our plans. First the treasure, then our men. Control of the Holy Land slipped away. But then he saw an opportunity. To reclaim what has been stolen. To turn your victories to our advantage. Al Muallim still holds your treasure, and we've routed your army before. Whatever Robert plans, he'll fail again. Ah, but it's not just Templars you'll contend with now. Speak sense. Robert rides for Asa to plead his case that Saracen and Crusader unite against the Assassins. That will never happen. They have no reason to. Had, perhaps. But now you've given them one. Nine, in fact. The bodies you've left behind, victims on both sides. You've made the Assassins an enemy in common and ensured the annihilation of your entire order. Well done. Not nine. Eight. What do you mean? You are not my target. I will not take your life. You're free to go, but do not follow me. I don't need to. You're already too late. At this very moment, Robert rode for Arsouf to plead his case to Richard the Lionheart, King of England and Duke of Normandy. He'd suggest that the Crusaders and the Saracens unite to defeat their common enemy, the Assassins, who had slain several of their own, allowing for Robert to reclaim the apple and to continue his own crusade completely uncontested. Before leaving for Arsouf, Altair met briefly with Malik. Altair instructed him to investigate the Templars further, suspecting that Al Mualim continued to deceive him. Defying custom, Altair opted not to return to Massey to approve of the mission, nor to inform the Brotherhood of the imminent attack. Al Mualim could no longer be trusted, and there was simply no time. And so Altair rode alone for Arsouf, where Saracens and Crusaders were embroiled in a chaotic bloodshed. As he moved closer, Altair could see the Crusader infantry and bowmen holding a ridge, felling any Saracen man or horse that came upon it. Up on a hill, Altair spotted a gigantic figure next to a distinctive steed, ginger hair and beard shining in the Levant heat. Altair bolted for Richard, slashing at any who stood in his way, Saracen or Crusader. Just yards away from the king, Richard's lieutenant circled him and his archers took position. In the seconds before they could draw, Altair carefully declared his intentions to negotiate and to tell the tale of Robert's deception. Come no further. Hold a moment. It's words I bring, not steal. Offering terms of surrender, then? It's about time. You misunderstand. It's Al Muallam who sends me, not Salah al -Din. Assassin! What is the meaning of this? And be quick with it! You've a traitor in your midst. And he has hired you to kill me? Come to gloat about it before you strike? I wouldn't be taken so easily! It's not you I've come to kill. It's him. Speak, then, that I may judge the truth! Who is this traitor? Robert de Sable. My lieutenant! <laughs> he aims to betray. That's not the way he tells it. He seeks revenge against your people for the havoc you've wrought in Acre. And I am inclined to support him. Some of my best men were murdered by some of yours. It was I who killed them, and for good reason. Hear me out. William of Montferrat. He sought to use his soldiers to take Acre by force. Gagné de plus. He would use his skills to indoctrinate and control any who resisted. Sabrand. He intended to block the ports, preventing your kingdom from providing aid. They betrayed you, and they took their orders from Robert. You expect me to believe this outlandish tale? You knew these men. Better than I. Are you truly surprised to learn of their ill intentions? Is this true? My liege. It is an assassin that stands before us. These creatures are masters of manipulation. Of course it isn't true. I've no reason to deceive. Oh, but you do. You're afraid of what will happen to your little fortress. Can it withstand the combined might of the Saracen and the Crusader army? My concern is for the people of the Holy Land. If I must sacrifice myself for there to be peace, so be it. This is a strange place we find ourselves in. Each of you accusing the other. There really is no time for this. I must be off to meet with Saladin and enlist his aid. The longer we delay, the harder this will become. Hold a moment, Robert. Why? What do you intend? Surely you do not believe him? It is a difficult decision, one I cannot make alone. I must leave it in the hands of one wiser than I. Thank you. No, Robert, not you. Then who? 
the Lord. Let this be decided by combat. Surely God will side with the one whose cause is righteous. If this is what you wish. It is. So be it. To arms, assassins! The remaining bodyguards formed a circle around the two. As Robert donned his helmet and chainmail gauntlet, Altair observed his confidence. He clearly remembered just how easily he had bested Altair just months before. He now stood armoured and invigorated in the face of an unworthy, tired, battle-worn opponent, unprotected by neither armour or skill. Robert was burdened with the same arrogance that had lost Altair their first bout, and so Altair, calm and thoughtful, danced around Robert's heavy strikes and wore the knight down, easily parrying the loose, desperate swings he made in retaliation. Finally, Altair ended Robert with a flick of the blade, piercing the red cross he wore on his chest. The two convened one last time as Richard and his lieutenants looked on with indifference. It's done then. Your schemes, like you, are put to rest. <laughs> you know nothing of schemes. You're but a puppet. He betrayed you, boy, just as he betrayed me. Speak sense, Templar, or not at all. Nine men he sent you to kill, yes? The nine who guarded the treasure's secret. What of it? It wasn't nine who found the treasure, assassin. Not nine, but ten. A tenth? None may live who carry the secret. Give me his name. Oh, but you know him well. And I doubt very much you take his life as willingly as you've taken mine. Who? It is your master, Al Mualim. But he is not a Templar. Did you never wonder how it is he knew so much? Where to find us? How many we numbered? What we aspired to attain? He is the master of the assassins. We, oui. master of lies. You and I just two more pawns in his grand game. And now, with my death, only you remain. Do you think he'll let you live, knowing what you do? I've no interest in the treasure. Ah, but he does. The only difference between your master and I is that he did not want to share. No. Ironic, isn't it? That I, your greatest enemy, kept you safe from harm. But now you've taken my life, and in the process, and did your own. Well fought, assassin. It seems God favors your cause this day. God had nothing to do with it. I was the better fighter. Ah, you may not believe in him, but it seems he believes in you. Before you go, I have a question. Ask it then. Why? Why travel all this way? Risk your life a thousand times, all to kill a single man. He threatened my brothers and what we stand for. Ah, vengeance then. No, not vengeance. Justice, that there might be peace. This is what you fight for? Peace? Do you see the contradiction? Some men cannot be reasoned with. Like that madman, Saladin. I think he'd like to see an end to this war as much as you. So I've heard, but never seen. Even if he doesn't say it, it's what the people want. Saracen and Crusader alike. The people know not what they want. It's why they turn to men like us. Then it falls to men like you to do what is right. <laughs> Nonsense. We come into the world kicking and screaming. Violent and unstable. It is what we are. We cannot help ourselves. No. We are what we choose to be. <laughs> Your kind. Always playing with words. I speak the truth. There's no trick to be found here. We'll know soon enough. But I fear you cannot have what you desire this day. Even now, that heathen Saladin cuts through my men and I must attend to them. But perhaps, having seen how vulnerable he is, he will reconsider his actions. Yes. In time, what you seek may be possible. You were no more secure than him. Do not forget that. The men you left behind to rule in your stead did not intend to serve you for longer than they had. Yes. Yes. I am well aware. 
Then I'll take my leave. My master and I have much to discuss. It seems that even he is not without fault. He is only human, as are we all. You, as well. Safety and peace be upon you. Altair returned to Masyaf overcast and deserted, devoid of any of the chatter or atmosphere typical of the village. Making his way to the citadel, Altair encountered a lone citizen, glassy-eyed, drooling, and senseless. The villagers spoke no real sense, mindlessly rattling off adages about the commands of a master and enlightenment. Moving closer to El Mualim, a group of glassy-eyed assassins circled Altair. He attempted only to incapacitate the group. Their actions were not their own, and there was no reason for them to die. Still, they had a tired and injured Altair pinned and outnumbered. Altair was only saved by a storm of throwing knives that forced them to flee. It was Malik and his assassins, unaffected by El Mualim's control. You picked a fine time to arrive. So it seems. Guard yourself well, friend. Al Mualim has betrayed us. Yes. Betrayed his Templar allies as well. How do you know? After we spoke, I returned to the ruins beneath Solomon's temple. Robert had kept a journal, filled its pages with revelations. What I read there broke my heart. But it also opened my eyes. You were right, Altair. All along, our master has used us. We were not meant to save the Holy Land, but deliver it to him. He must be stopped. Be careful, Malik. What he's done to the others, he'll do to us given the chance. You must stay far from him. What would you propose? My blade arm is still strong and my men remain my own. It would be a mistake not to use us. Distract these thralls then. Assault the fortress from behind. If you can draw their attention away from me, I might reach Al Muallam. I will do as you ask, Dai. The men we face. Their minds are not their own. If you can avoid killing them. Yes. Though he has betrayed the tenets of the Creed, it does not mean we must as well. I'll do what I can. It's all I ask. Safety and peace, my friend. Your presence here will deliver us both. In the main courtyard, it became apparent why the marketplace was so desolate. Here, all of Masyaf's villagers wandered around lifelessly and without direction, chanting mantras of the great al Mualim, master of all. Altair pushed through and entered the garden. Al Mualim overlooking from a balcony. The piece of Eden was now uncased, glowing, pulsing, and emitting an orange haze that seized Altair in its light. No! What's happening? So, a student returns. I've never been one to run. Uh, never been one to listen either. I still live because of it. What will I do with you? Let me go. Oh, Altair. I hear the hatred in your voice. Feel its heat. Let you go? Now that would be unwise. Why are you doing this? I found proof. Proof of what? That nothing is true. And everything is permitted. Come. Destroy the betrayer. Send him from this world! Nine men were cast from the apple, back for revenge, unreal but dangerous nonetheless. The weaker of his targets came first, Majadeen, Abul Nakad, and then the more skilled swordsman. Still, no match for Altair. Amwalim retaliated by deploying illusions of himself this time. His new, enhanced selves were strong, agile, well beyond his years, and still, no match. Altair, now weary with exhaustion, blood loss, and the sickly sorcery of the Peace of Eden, was on his very last legs. But a well-timed strike to Al Mualim emboldened his rage. Al Mualim appeared and reappeared, atrophying with every use of the device, becoming more careless as Altair seized the upper hand. Al Mualim only continued to overindulge in a power that he knew very little of, tiring with every use. He was now open for Altair to strike with his hidden blade. Impossible. The student does not defeat the teacher. So it seems. You have won then. Go and claim your prize. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. Destroy the only thing capable of ending the Crusades and creating true peace? Never. 
Then I will. We'll see about that. I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know... Picking up the apple, Altair ached and swelled initially, though was soon cleansed of his weariness and reinvigorated with power. He began to see images, vast, shining cities, grand but old, ancient, thousands of years old. Then images of the future, machinery and devices. Some would incite great human advancement and others would propel despair, conflict and death. Finally, a globe was emitted from its light projecting symbols and writings in a language that Altair couldn't discern. He tried to bring himself to destroy this corruptive power, to be done with it, but his body simply wouldn't allow it. Altair turned to see that al Mulim's brainwashing had subsided. Malik and his men stood before him with devoted eyes, desirous of leadership. Altair was the master now. Immediately following al Mulim's death, Altair took his body to be burnt. It was forbidden in assassin custom, but he had to be absolutely sure that he was dead. Although Abbas hated al Mulim, maybe even more than he did Altair, his old resentment still consumed him. And so capitalizing on the complete disorientation of the Brotherhood, he raised a rebellion. In the commotion, Abbas stole the apple and immediately gave in to its temptation. He activated it, sucking the life out of him and the village. What was that? Are they dead? Forgive me. I did not know. Have you anything to teach us? Would you lead us all to ruin? Altair ensured that no rebel was killed or punished. His next act as leader was proving that al Mualim was indeed guilty. He demonstrated his suitability as leader by embodying the very principles he wished to inspire, the love and loyalty of the Brotherhood. Altair spent a lot of his time reflecting and recording his thoughts in his journal. He obsessed over the woman at Maj's funeral, and in the following months, he would comprise the first pages of his codex. I have spent days with the artifact now, or has it been weeks, months? I can no longer be certain. The others come from time to time, offering food or distraction. They say I should separate myself from these studies. Malik has even suggested I abandon them entirely, but I am not yet ready to turn away. This Apple of Eden will be understood. It must be. Is it a weapon? Is it a catalogue? Is it somehow both? He who increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The philosophy of such a statement I can understand, but for it to be true, literally true, a society that waged wars with ideas and information in place of steel and swords. Its function is simple, elementary even, dominion, control, but the process, the methods and means it employs. These are fascinating. Those subjected to its glow are promised all that they desire. It asks only one thing in return, complete and total obedience. And who can truly refuse? It is temptation incarnate. I remember my own moment of weakness when confronted by al Mualim. My confidence shaken by his words. He, who had been like a father, was now revealed to be my greatest enemy. Just the briefest flicker of doubt was all he needed to creep into my mind. But I vanquished his phantoms, restored my self-confidence, and sent him from this world. I freed myself. But now I wonder, did I really? For here I sit, desperate to understand that which I swore to destroy. This is why. The apple has a tale to tell. I sense the flickers of something. Great and dangerous. We are all at risk. It is my duty to do something about it. I must not, cannot turn away until I found the truth. Robert the Saab may be dead, but his brotherhood survives. Though less conspicuous in appearance, I fear they remain a threat. Where once they proudly walk the streets making for easier targets, now they retreat into the shadows. It grows difficult to track them. What wicked things will they weave in the darkness? Our work will be all the more complicated for it. Already there are rumours of a movement on Cyprus. I will have to investigate. With the apples still sought after, the assassins and it would never be safe. And so Altair decided to conduct an attack on the Templar's new stronghold, Aka Harbour. As he and a group of assassins stole through the Aka port, they noticed an uncharacteristic absence of Templar guards. Inside the stronghold, Altair eavesdropped on a conversation between three people inside. One voice he recognised immediately. The Templar woman from the cemetery in Jerusalem, who he now discovered was named Maria. He also overheard that their new leader was a man named Armand Bouchard, who apparently held Maria in a low regard. She was designated to stay in Acre, 
As suspected, it looked as if the Templars were relocating to Cyprus. Altair could see the ships leaving the harbour, though the motive behind the move still didn't make itself clear. Still captivated by her, Altair had to speak to Maria, and against his better instincts, he confronted her. She attacked him before he had any chance to speak, and his admiration for her renewed as she skillfully jousted around him. A better fighter than even some of his own men. Still, Altair bested her once more and attempted to interrogate her. Getting nothing about the Templars, but discovering that they assumed the assassins to be leaderless and divided. An assumption Altair had no reason to correct. Soon after, Altair set course for Cyprus, Maria in tow. He hoped to use her as Templar bait, although on some level he did just want to spend time with her. Over time, any sentence uttered long and loud enough becomes fixed becomes a truth, provided, of course, you can outlast the descent and silence your opponents. But should you succeed and remove all challenges, then what remains is, by default, now true. Is it truth in some objective sense? No. But how does one ever achieve an objective point of view? The answer is you don't. It is literally, physically impossible. There are too many variables, too many fields and formulae to consider. We can try, of course, we can inch closer and closer to a revelation, but we'll never reach it. Not ever. And so I have realised that so long as the Templars exist, they will attempt to bend reality to their will. They recognise there is no such thing as an absolute truth. Or if there is, we are hopelessly under-equipped to recognise it. And so in its place, they seek to create their own explanation. It is the guiding principle of their so-named New World Order. To reshape existence in their own image. It is not about artefacts, not about men. These are merely tools. Clever of them. But how does one wage war against a concept? It is the perfect weapon. It lacks a physical form, yet can alter the world around us in numerous, often violent ways. You cannot kill a creed. Even if you kill all of its adherents, destroy all of its writings, these are a reprieve at best. Someone, someday, will rediscover it. Reinvent it. I believe that even we, the assassins, have simply rediscovered an order that predates the old man himself. Arriving in the city of Limassol on the island's southern coast, it became apparent that the Templars owned Cyprus. Most citizens confined themselves to their homes out of fear of Templar persecution. In response, there was a growing resistance, and Altair hoped to ally with them. Altair met Alexander, a member of the rebel cause. Alexander offered to hold Maria in one of their safe houses, while Altair infiltrated Limassol Castle, where he would assassinate the stronghold's current leader, Frederick the Red. This would give way for Osman to take over, a Templar sympathetic to the Cypriot, and by extension, the assassin cause. Osman used what power he had to reduce the castle watch, making it easy for Altair to sneak through the castle and put an end to Frederick, weakening the Templar rule and giving an ally some jurisdiction over Templar forces. According to Osman, the Templars had purchased Cyprus to uncover some kind of archive, though what the Templars were archiving and why remained a mystery. Returning to the safe house, Altair noticed a lack of guards patrolling the streets below, and soon it became clear why. As he bounded from rooftop to rooftop, getting closer to the safe house, a thick, black cloud of smoke grew bigger. Altair was furious. All he could think about was Maria. She could be burning or choking to death at this very moment. In his anger, he slew the Templars outside the safe house. He called out for Maria, but got no answer. Exhausted, and now faced with the wanton blades of more approaching Templars, he returned to the safety of the rooftops. From a bell tower, Altair observed the unrest on the streets below. Citizens were now leaving their homes, talking of retribution and maltreatment. There were also whispers of Armand Bouchard. Apparently he had arrived on the island, though all of that became insignificant when Altair spotted Maria in the square below, alive, well, and flanked by two Templars. It looked as if she was being held captive. The whispers were correct. Armand took his place in the square. Much like the Saab, he was an imposing figure, large and sullen, with a commanding voice to match. Frederick the Red, slain. He who served God and the people of Cyprus with honor, is paid tribute with a murderer's blade? Who among you will deliver those responsible to me? Cowards. You leave me no choice but to flush out this killer myself. I hereby grant my men immunity until this investigation is concluded. Bouchard, the citizens are already restless. Perhaps this is not the best idea. If anyone else has objections, I invite you to step forward. Armand Bouchard! Who's that? Ah, an old colleague. Bouchard, 
An assassin has come to Cyprus. I managed to escape, but he cannot be far behind. Why, Maria, that would make this your second miraculous escape from the assassins, no? Once when De Saab was the target, and now here on my island. I am not in league with the assassins, Bouchard. Please, listen. De Saab was a weak-willed wretch. Verse 70 of the Founding Templar rule expressly forbids consorting with women. For it is through women that the devil weaves his strongest web. De Saab ignored this tenant and paid with his life. How dare you! Touched a nerve, did I? Lock her up! As Maria was dragged away, Altair's naive, childlike fantasies shattered. She had tried to sell him out. Still, when confronted with the choice to kill the leader of the Templars or to save Maria, he opted for the latter with little, if any, hesitation. He made short work of Maria's two captors once they reached a quieter street. Maria, furious to be branded a traitor, assured Altair that she would have his head. Altair responded by explaining that the Templars would much rather have the artifact later than his head now. I will kill you when I get the chance. If you get the chance. But then you'll never find the Apple of Eden. And what would curry more favor with the Templars right now? My head or that artifact? I thought so. Altair met once again with Alexander, who explained that Bouchard had taken Maria's warning seriously and fled to Kyrenia, a settlement on the island's northern coast, and so the two sailed north on a pirate ship, presuming the roles of a monk and his companion. Altair found somewhere quiet and gazed into the apple again, continuing his journal. The apple is more than a catalogue of that which precedes us. Within its twisting, sparking innards, I caught glimpses of what will be. Such a thing should not be possible. Perhaps it isn't. Maybe it is simply a suggestion. How to know? How to be sure? I contemplate the consequences of these visions. Are they images of things to come, or simply the potential for what might be? Can we influence the outcome? Dare we try? And in doing so, do we merely ensure that which we've seen? I am torn, as always, between action and inaction. Unclear as to which, if either, will make a difference. Am I even meant to make a difference? Still, I keep this journal. Is that not an attempt to change, or perhaps guarantee what I've seen? Of all the things I've seen, none troubles me more than the image of the flames. Pillars so tall they seemed to pierce the heavens. The ground rumbled and shuddered. Mountains split and crack. Great metal towers splintered, their innards strewn across the ground, and everywhere there was screaming. A chorus so terrible that even now I feel its echoes still. What is this madness I have seen? Is it them, I wonder? Those who came before? Is this what they want? Into the fire? Into the dust? Perhaps this destructive power is what the Templars seek, that they might hold it over us as a command devotion. What hope would we have if they held such darkness in their hands, that they could murder the world? Altair and Maria conversed honestly for a while, with Maria finally letting her guard down, clasping her knees to her chest sat beside Altair. Maria talked about her childhood, a lonely one devoid of compassion, with her parents constantly seeking to expel her more adventurous qualities. She was arranged to marry a man named Peter at 18. He was quaint and pleasant, everything that she wasn't, and Peter, like her parents, sought to be rid of her more virile, untamed qualities in place of those more typical of an English lady. After a few unbearable years of this, she fled to the Crusade, disguising herself as a man so she could serve as a soldier. Robert took a liking to Maria, and her to him. This was the first time her potential had ever been acknowledged, but also exploited. She now understood that he hadn't been worthy of her affection. In tragedy, Altair saw the potential for learning, and began to explain the theories of the Greek philosopher Empedocles, that life began simply, with disembodied hands, eyes, and legs, eventually evolving into all the forms of life we know of today. This was an idea she shook off as nonsensical. He rebutted with the theorem of Muslim philosopher Al-Kindi. One must never be afraid of new ideas, no matter their source, even when the truth pains us. Still not getting through to Maria, Altair tried again. Only a mind free of impediments is capable of grasping the chaotic beauty of the world. This is our greatest asset. But is chaos something to be celebrated? Is disorder a virtue? It presents us with challenges, yes, but freedom yields greater rewards than the alternative. The order and peace that the Templars seek requires servility and imprisonment. Hmm, I know the feeling. I knew it was him, I told you. 
Having seen the hidden blade, one of the pirates shouted to the others, rallying a force to seize the traitor and the assassin, who could surely be traded in for a handsome reward. As Altair turned to face the man, Maria kicked him in the face and made another bid for her freedom, escaping Altair who was left alone to deal with the pirates. Amateur and arrogant, he cut through them effortlessly. Finding Maria again presented no real difficulty, with Altair only needing to follow the commotion of a fight between her and some soon-to-be-dead pirates. One of the men in the hubbub was Marcos, a resistance member who had aided Altair by imprisoning Maria, who at this point knew much better than to attempt another escape. At Kyrenia's safe house, an unassuming grain store, Altair met one of Alexander's resistance contacts, Barnabas, an affable, if somewhat obnoxious ally. According to him, Bouchard was most likely in Buffavento Castle, a fortress that once belonged to a wealthy Cypriot noblewoman. Barnabas could get Altair inside, on the condition he did him the favour of killing Jonas, a resistance traitor who had been feeding the Templars important information. Jonas was easily found and stopped. Before Altair killed him, he explained that a Templar named the Bull had placed a bounty on both him and Maria. Who were the ones that came before? What brought them here? How long ago? Centuries? Millennia? Longer still? So little remains of them. What drove them out? What of these artifacts? Messages in a bottle? Tools left behind to aid and guide us? Or do we fight for control over their refuse, giving divine purpose and meaning to little more than discarded toys? Why do our instincts insist on violence? I've studied the interaction between different species. The innate desire to survive seems to demand the death of the other. So many believe the world was created by the hand of a divine power, but I see only the designs of a madman, bent on celebrating destruction and desperation. Our origins seem chaotic, unintended, purpose and being instilled solely by the passage of time, imposed first by nature and later men. Back at the grain store, Barnabas was gleeful about the death of Jonas, a fact that didn't sit with Altair, who saw no pleasure in death, any death. Barnabas told Altair that Jonas's betrayal wasn't known to the Resistance, and that his murder would cause riots. The withdrawing of this information only made Altair more unsure of this repulsive man. Altair watched the unrest in person atop the roof of a nearby church. If the bull decided to name Altair as Jonas's killer, which he was likely to do, it would only cause more trouble the man had to die. Returning to the grain store, Barnabas was nowhere to be found, just Marcos and Maria. Altair explained the outrage outside, that a man named Jonas had been killed. Altair's heart sank as Marcos informed him that Jonas was an ally of his father's, and a good man by all accounts. Maria had let slip that the bull resided in Cantara, a Templar stronghold to the east, with a reputation for its ironclad defence. As Altair stole through the base, he gathered some interesting information about the bull, or Moloch, from his fanatical soldiers. He was devoutly religious, and his faith in God was only rivaled by his faith in Bouchard, to whom he was completely obedient. The Christians held the bull and his followers in open contempt, seeing their sect as a blotch on their movement. As Altair reached the bull, it became clear where the name came from. He was enormous, bald, and sported an outrageous, comical moustache. His torso was completely bare, with the exception of a medallion. His weapon of choice was a weight attached to a chain, a weapon he was said to have pinpoint accuracy with. And with this in mind, as well as Moloch's size advantage, Altair opted to do all that he could to remain hidden. Altair dropped from the rafters into the hall, directly behind the bull. Altair leapt and activated his blade, but with almost inhuman timing, Moloch turned and grabbed Altair. He raised him up effortlessly, inspecting a struggling Altair with a childlike curiosity as the blackness closed in. He tossed Altair to one side to begin the clash anew, craving more amusement. Cautious and on the back foot, Altair knew he'd have to outsmart the bull, now swinging his flail gleefully. Each swing came a little closer to caving Altair's head in than the last. Your tyranny ends here, Moloch. <laughs> it will continue beyond me and you. And for sure, it will outlast us all. <laughs> Returning to Marcos, Altair found that Maria was gone. Again, you haven't gone back five, ten minutes, 
This is just what the fucking game is. She'd been recaptured by the Crusaders who had mounted an attack on the Resistance. Marcos also explained that Barnabas, the real Barnabas, had been executed the day Altier arrived in Kyrenia, replaced by a Templar agent. According to a theory Marcos had heard, the Templars had found their safe house with the aid of a woman, a dark oracle. Altier had no time to ponder what this meant. The most prescient matter wasn't this oracle or even displacing the Templars. It was Maria. He sought her out among resistance prisoners in the cells in the harbour district, to no luck. A prisoner revealed that the Bull's son, Shalem, had seized Maria personally, taking her to Bufavento Castle. Altea had no problem infiltrating the fortress again, but he couldn't find Maria. Only Shalem, and on the other side of a steel gate, Bouchard, who was rebuking Shalem for letting her escape again worried that Maria would lead the assassin to the archive. He was convinced she had betrayed their cause entirely. Bouchard handed Shalem a sack and told him to deliver it to Alexander. Altier followed Bouchard through the castle. He conversed with a group of guards who told him that the Dark Oracle had injured two of their own. When Altier entered the cell of this Dark Oracle, he found a vast lair covered in foliage and a thick mist. She leapt at Altair with what looked to be claws, but on closer inspection, they were nails, ungroomed, long and sharp. This wasn't an oracle or a witch. This was the noblewoman that Barnabas had spoke of, the owner of the castle. Now grey, unkempt and feral, used only by the Templars for Cypriot information, Altier put her out of her misery and returned to the safe house. His next task was following Shalom, who didn't impress Altair. He lacked his father's devotion, and in its place was a penchant for drinking and whoring. Altier tracked him as he bullied townsfolk and belittled prostitutes, indiscretions that required frequent confessions. Altier pressed a monk on if it troubled him to suffer Shalem's sins. He replied that it did, but opposing the Templars meant death. He let slip that they had too much at stake with the archive, but he realized his mistake and shuffled away before Altier could press any further. Later, a commotion erupted around the orator's platform. It was Shalem. Somehow he was sober, fresh-faced, and eloquent in his speech. He wasn't just dissimilar to the man Altier had followed minutes before, he was completely different in demeanor, language, and philosophy. He waited and watched upon a perch until he spotted a group of courtesans being ushered outside, with Maria disguised as one of them. Altier followed Maria to Shalem, where all became clear. This wasn't Shalem. It was his twin brother, Shahar. His face wasn't worn by the hedonistic pleasures that Shalem lived for. The distinction was fairly clear. It turned out that the purpose of Maria's disguise was to gain entry to the castle and to question Shahar regarding the new information Altea had presented her. I'm not here to be flattered. I want answers. Oh? Is it true what I've heard? That the Templars wish to use the Apple of Eden for ill? Not to enlighten the people, but to subdue them? People are confused, Maria. They're lambs begging to be led. And that's what we offer. Simple lives, free of worry. But our order was created to protect the people, not rob them of their liberty. The Templars put no stock in liberty, Maria. We seek order, nothing more. Order or enslavement? You can call it whatever you like, my dear. Assassin! Ah. Apologies, Shalim. I let myself in. You're looking for Shalim, eh? I'm sure my brother would be happy to join us. Two of them, and two of us. Altair was frustrated. Allies had betrayed him, and those who may have become allies disregarded his gestures. He headed back to the safe house, and at least there, there was some good news. The Templars were packing up and leaving Kyrenia, and so it was certain the Archive wasn't there. Most of their ships were headed to Limassol, and so Altair followed. Hopefully he'd find the Archive, and that he could finally unravel their intentions. Some days I miss my family or at least the thought of them. I never knew my parents well, despite them both having lived within Masias' walls. It was our way. Perhaps they were sad, though they showed no sign. 
it was not allowed. For my part, so much of my youth was spent in training. There was little time left to reflect upon the separation, and so when they were finally lost to me, it seemed no different than the passing of two strangers. Al Mualim had been as my father, and his was a weak and dishonest love, though at the time it seemed enough, better even, or so I thought. Someday I will have a child, such is the way of our order and I will not make the same mistake, nor any who calls himself an assassin. We shall be allowed to love our children, and in turn, to be loved. Al Mualim believed such attachments would weaken us, cause us to falter when our lives were on the line. But if we truly fight for what is just, does love not make such sacrifice simpler, knowing that we do so for their gain? Altair soon located the Resistance's new hideout, hoping to confront Alexander about what he'd heard in Bufavento. But when he entered, it was the latter who raised his sword, declaring Altair a traitor to the cause, a misunderstanding that put Altair at ease. The sack Bouchard had sent to Alexander was a receptacle for Barnabas's head, and as Altair expected, he didn't recognise the face it bore. Not only had he and Alexander been deceived, but many of the men in the Resistance, who thanks to Templar propaganda, believed Altair to be a traitor to the cause. Altair scoured Limassol, and there was no sign of Bouchard. Back at the safe house, Alexander had left a note. He arranged to meet with Altair in the courtyard of a castle, or at least that's what the note said. Altair had never seen Alexander's handwriting, and so he had no frame of reference to dismiss the note as being fraudulent. Carefully, Altair entered the courtyard and found a body in its centre. It was Alexander. Up on the ramparts, a crusader mocked him. Altier shielded his eyes and discovered it was Barnabas, the imposter Barnabas, who had set him up. A horde of Cypriot citizens were now running at him, believing he was Alexander's killer. Altier stood his ground. His impulse was to draw his blade, but he couldn't kill civilians. He wouldn't. Not again. Then it came to him the Peace of Eden. Altair held it out in front of him, and the apple did the rest. In a mere moment, Altair had turned the tides, from a man who was virtually dead, to one who possessed total omnipotence. At this moment more than ever, Altair understood its complete power, and so he also understood the threat that it posed. Wary, he addressed his crowd of subjects. Our man Bouchard is the man responsible for your misery. He hired this man to poison the resistance against itself. Go from this place, and rally your men. Cyprus will be yours once again! Quite a toy you have there. Do you mind if I borrow it? Ah! So, you had it all along. And now you see what kind of weapon it could be, in the wrong hands. I don't know that I'd call yours the right hands. No, quite right. I will destroy it. Or hide it. Until I find the archive, I can't say. Well, look no further. You're standing on it. Kill him! Kill the assassin! This way, quickly! Altair quickly lost Maria as Templar soldiers descended. After dealing with the soldiers, he followed Maria's tracks, finding himself in a descending, cavernous walkway, torches lighting his way. He could hear distant shouting. Maria was surely in trouble. She had betrayed the Templars beyond any deniability. She had killed one of their own and led an assassin to their archive. Altair navigated his way through the depths of a grand library, though its contents weren't so. This couldn't be the renowned archive. It was much too scarce. Finally, he reached a grand chamber, a Templar cross at its center, currently being jeweled upon by Bouchard and Maria. Altair entered and Armand monologued the archive's history. Prior to the beginning of the Third Crusade in 1191, Cyprus was ruled by a Templar puppet, Emperor Isaac Comnenus. Isaac waged war with Richard the Lionheart and lost, losing Cyprus in the process. Anxious that Richard would discover the archive, the Templars bought the island, and all this time the Templars hadn't been filling it, they'd been exporting its contents. Whatever information was there, Altair was too late to attain it. When Bouchard finally lunged at Altair, he parried and sidestepped with grace and speed. He was unlike many crusaders, who relied on brute strength to win a bout. Skilled as he was, he was no match for Altair, who cut and nicked and finally ran through Bouchard. You are a, a credit to your creed, Altair. And you have strayed from yours. Not strayed. Expanded. The world is more complicated than most dare admit. And if you, assassin, if you knew more than how to murder, you might understand this. Save your lecture on virtue for yourself. 
and die knowing that I will never let the Apple of Eden fall into any hands but my own. Keep it close, Altair. You will come to the same conclusions we did. In time. Everything I worked for in the Holy Land, I no longer want. And everything I gave up to join the Templars. I wonder where all that went. And if I should try to find it again. Will you return to England? No. I am so far from home already. I'll continue on. East. To India, perhaps. Or until I fall off the far edge of the world. And you? For a long time under Al Mualim. I thought my life had reached its limit, and that my sole duty was to show others the same precipice I had discovered. Yes, I felt the same once. As terrible as this artifact is, it contains wonders. I would like to understand it as best I can. You tread a thin line, Altair. I know, but I have been ruined by curiosity, Maria. I want to meet the best minds, explore all the libraries of the world and learn all the secrets of nature and the universe. All in one lifetime? It's a little ambitious. Who can say? It could be that one life is just enough. Maybe. And where will you go first? East. I had thought Ada would be the one to lead me to rest, that I might lay down my blade and live as a normal man. But now I know such dreams are best left to sleep. Her face. I tried to banish it from my mind as I remember the days and nights during which I chased her Templar captors across the sea. I almost got to them in time. Almost. Instead, I held her lifeless body in my arms. Saw the terror reflected in her fixed, unblinking eyes. I hunted each man, one by one, until all responsible were gone from the world. But there was no joy in this. No satisfaction or release. Their deaths did not bring her back, did not heal my wounds. After that, I was certain I would never feel for a woman as I had for her. I am fortunate to have been wrong. In 1195, three years after the destruction of the Archive, Altair and Maria were wed in Lemassot. The ceremony was held there to honour the Cypriots, who had allowed the assassins to make Cyprus a key stronghold. They returned to Masiaf the same year where their first son, Darren, was born. And two years after that, their second son, Seth, was conceived in Acre. The following years were peaceful and fruitful for Altair, who spent much of his time writing his codex and using the apple to make grand discoveries. It's during these years he composed designs that the assassins would use for centuries to come. Medicines and poisons that could be employed by use of the hidden blade, and an entirely new design that didn't ask for the removal of the ring finger, as well as a general overhaul of the weapon. The hidden blade has been a constant companion of ours over the years. Some would even say it defines us, and they would not be entirely wrong. Many of our successes would not have been possible without it. Still, the device has begun to show its age, and so I have been researching improvements beyond ending the need to remove one's finger to wield it. The first is the addition of a metal plate that can be used to deflect incoming blows. The other assassins believe it is forged of a new metal, and credit me with the discovery of the formula. It is better that they not know the truth. I have also worked with Malik to describe new methods of assassination, from on high, from ledges, 
bridges and from hiding places. Basic movements, but critical nonetheless. The third and final improvement is the most simple, the provision of a second blade, identical in every way to the first. Should an assassin ever find himself tasked with dispatching two targets, he need only time his strike in such a way that he might reach both at the same time. These blades will be limited in number since the metals with which we forge them remain difficult to obtain. I will need to think carefully about who shall be allowed to carry two. In this period of great discovery, Altair also acknowledged that there were hypocrisies embedded in the Creed's doctrine and traditions. He wrote of these two. I realise that our tactics too must change. It means an end to our fortresses, to our penchant for spectacular displays of public assassinations. We must weave our webs quietly and we must do so differently than we have in the past. Though I ask my brothers now to abandon their rituals, I do not ask that they abandon the creed. This is what makes us assassins. Not the removal of a finger, not a false promise of paradise, not the prohibition of poison. Our duty is to the people, not to custom. If we must sneak, we shall sneak. If we must use poison, we shall use poison. If our blades can be used without removing fingers, we shall not demand they be taken. And we shall not manipulate our initiates with lies and parlor tricks. We shall speak plainly and honestly. We shall be made anew. What follows are the three great ironies of the assassin order. Here we seek to promote peace, but murder is our means. Here we seek to open the minds of men, but require obedience to a master and set of rules. Here we seek to reveal the danger of blind faith, yet we are practitioners ourselves. I have no satisfactory answer to these charges, only possibilities. Do we bend the rules in service to a greater good? And if we do, what does it say of us? That we are liars, that we are frauds, that we are weak? Every moment is spent wrestling with these contradictions, and in spite of all the years I've had to reflect, still, I can find no suitable answer and I fear that one may not exist. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. Does our creed provide the answer then, that one may be two things opposite in every way simultaneously? And why not? Am I not proof? We of noble intentions possessed of barbaric means. We who celebrate the sanctity of life and then promptly take it from those we deem our enemies. Altier kept these principles in mind in the following years he spent traveling the East promoting the Assassin's Creed. His only notable failure was in Constantinople in the year 1204, when the Crusaders sacked the city, forcing an assassin retreat. He continued to promote the Brotherhood further east, where the Mongolian Genghis Khan stood as an obstacle. A dark tide rises to the east, an army of such size and power that all the land is made quick with worry. Their leader is a man named Temujin, who has adopted the title Genghis Khan. He sweeps across the lands, conquering and subsuming all who stand in his way. Whatever his motives, he must be stopped. Were I younger, I might attempt to undertake this work in secret, as I suspect the presence of a piece of Eden. But those days are years gone now. The mantle must be passed. It is time she and I spoke with our sons. We will travel there together, that they may be tested and that this threat might be stopped. In 1217, a 52-year-old Altair journeyed to Mongolia to assassinate Genghis. He took Maria and Darum with him, Seth being left to care for his wife and daughters in Masia, which was left under the control of Malik for the time being. The three enlisted the help of the Mongolian assassin Kulan Gel, who took the family to Xinqing in the Western Jia Empire, currently under siege by Mongol forces. Darum, now a young man proficient with a crossbow, took a vantage point and made way for Kulan and Altair to infiltrate the Mongol camp. The two made their way towards the Khan's tent, and Altair, no longer as youthful or cogent as he once was, was spotted and injured. This allowed for the Khan to make a brief escape before being fatally shot by Darum. Genghis's Sword of Eden was taken by the Mongol assassins and Altair, Darum and Maria headed home to Masyaf. They had been away for a decade now, and by the time Altair and his family returned to Masyaf, it was 1228, and much had changed. Their homecoming wasn't a sweet one. The villagers watched the party enter with wary eyes, and there was nothing in the way of a welcome. Curiously, the castle now flew a flag that displayed the assassin insignia. Years ago, Altair had decreed that all such symbols should be removed, but clearly Malik saw otherwise. They were met at the gates by Swami an apprentice not particularly well liked by Altair, a man much too eager to fight and much less to learn. He wore a disingenuous smile as he welcomed Altair, failing to address him by his proper title. He seemed surprised by Altair's arrival, despite him having sent messages to Masyaf confirming as much. In the same messages, Altair had requested that Raouf meet him at the gates, though he had apparently died years earlier of the fever, and Altair was given no notification. Something wasn't right, 
Nothing was right. Swami accommodated Altair, Maria, and Darum in a modest vestibule. Altair was a humble man without pretension, but giving a master such simple accommodation was truly bizarre. Maria asked where Seth was. Alamut, hundreds of miles east on unknown business, according to Swami. Altair had had enough and demanded to be brought to Malik. He'd have some answers, surely. Swami, clearly nervous now, explained that he'd been imprisoned and that all would become clear at tomorrow's council meeting, an assembly created with Abbas as its leader. Altair told Swami to inform Abbas that the council should be dissolved. Their leader was back and wished to resume leadership. After Swami left, Altair sent Darum to Alamut. They needed Seth and Masiaf. The next day, Swami walked Altair and Maria to the council. Altair observed no swordplay or training in the courtyard. All life had left Masiaf. The council gathered in the main hall, where there were ten men. The so-called council, composed of the most devious and dull of their brotherhood. One of the men was Faram, Swami's father, who like his son had grown shamelessly fat. At the council's head was Abbas, who for the first time since his father's suicide, Altair no longer pitied. He now saw what Abbas had always seen in him, a genuine antagonist. Abbas exuded contempt immediately. He couldn't help himself. He insulted Maria, calling her an infidel and commanding that Altair kept her quiet whenever she spoke. Altair rose and moved his hand to his hilt, and when Abbas commanded that his weapons be taken, Altair conceded. Abbas inquired about the mission to uproot Genghis Khan, but Altair didn't comply, demanding Abbas tell him what happened to Malik. At an impasse, Altair conceded again, relaying his missions east to Persia, India, and Mongolia. Done toying with Altair, Abbas revealed where Malik was, sentenced to life in the dungeons for the murder of Seth. According to Abbas, two weeks ago, Seth was found stabbed to death in his bed, and the corresponding knife was found in Malik's quarters. Just hours after the two had reportedly argued about the assassin leadership, in wake of the news of Altair's return. Altair was racked with doubts, doubts about his supposed greatness as a leader, the future of the Brotherhood, and above all, Malik, his closest brother. Now he contemplated if it was ever even real, if Malik had harboured hatred towards him since their mission in Solomon's temple, if he had simply been biding his time to displace him and to avenge Kadar. It certainly wouldn't be the first time that a loved one had turned on him. Altair had to know the truth. That night, he infiltrated the dungeons to find Malik emaciated and weak. When he laid eyes on Altair, there was relief and thankfulness, immediately dismissing any of his silly notions of doubt or betrayal. Malik truly was his brother. Back at their accommodation, Malik revealed what truly happened to Seth and to Masiaf. Murdered two years ago, Abbas staged his coup. He had Seth killed, then placed the murder weapon in my room. Another assassin swore that he'd heard Seth and me arguing, and Abbas brought the Brotherhood to the conclusion that it was I who was responsible for Seth's murder. I'm sorry, I couldn't send a message while I was in prison. Besides, Abbas controlled all communications in and out of the fortress. No doubt, he's been busy changing other ordinances during my imprisonment for his own benefit. I'm sorry, Altair. I should have anticipated Abbas's plans. For years after your departure, he worked to undermine me. I had no idea he had managed to command such support. It would not have happened to a stronger leader. It would not have happened to you. It was clearer than ever that Altair had to destroy Abbas, and Maria didn't hesitate to remind him of why. Not for vengeance or retribution, but for the good of the Brotherhood. As Altair made his way to confront Abbas, a bell sounded beckoning a group of torch-carrying assassins into the courtyard where Altair stood. Abbas emerged from the tower, looking down on Altair, using his infiltration of the dungeons and the consequent attack on a guard as ammunition. Swami passed Abbas a sack, from which he retrieved Malik's disembodied head. Abbas continued his performance as Altair and Maria protested. Abbas accused them of taking revenge on Malik. Abbas grabbed Maria and held her at knife point, threatening to kill her if Altair didn't hand over the apple. As the two bickered, Altair tried appealing to the crowd of assassins and civilians who had gathered there, attempting to expose Abbas's hateful agenda, though for the most part they were left confused and unsure of who to commit to. With no other choice, Altair conceded a final time, holding the apple out as Swami came closer to retrieve it. Before I executed your son, I told him you ordered it yourself. He died. Believing you had betrayed him. Ah! El Tayer! El Tayer! No! Strength, El Tayer. Maria, 
He is possessed! Kill him! Take the apple! No! Bass's men, fearful and cautious, gave chase to Altair, who tried to swerve and resist each arrow volley and swipe to middling success. Bleeding heavily and more vulnerable than ever, Altair scaled Masiaf's citadel. With Abbas's men in close pursuit, he stumbled to one of its platforms, and one last time, he outstretched his arms and dropped. Altair and Darum escaped Masiaf together, riding out for Alamut, to Seth's widowed wife and their two daughters. Within just a year, all four of them had left Altair, who had grown unbearably miserable and resentful. Resentful of the apple, and of all of the pain that it had caused. For the next twenty years or so, it would be his only company. The stories it shared were ones of torment, not just from his own life, but from this bizarre culture, completely foreign in both location and time. Ever since the day that Altair had first picked up the apple, he understood that it had the capacity for good, and so determined to uncover it and to make all of his suffering worth something, Altair spent every single day studying it. Journals, ideologies, schematics, philosophies, memories. Altair would spend days on end writing of it. One day, the apple guided him beneath Alamut's assassin fortress, revealing a temple belonging to the ones who came before. There he found six seals, six new artifacts designed to convey memories to their reader. He encoded five of the six seals, with only a vague idea of what, or rather who, they were for. The Prophet. I have the answer now. I know the truth. I shall not touch that wretched thing again. Best that no one do, now or ever. I have tried at last to destroy it, but it will neither bend nor break nor melt. Oh, the irony. I am certain if I asked, the apple would tell me what need be done. But even this promise is insufficient. Always it holds one more gift to give. I must refrain, so it shall be sealed. We will take it to the island. Once there's, now as. There is a treasury there, hidden well and it shall have to suffice. Risky to separate myself from the artifact that others may discover it. Riskier still to keep it close. In time, I will be tempted. I am weak. We all are. Who wouldn't be? Oh, the things I have seen. The tale is here, inside the text. Not between the lines, but beneath them, where only our eyes might peer. Go and see it for yourself, that you might succeed where I and others have failed. Time marches on, bringing with it new discoveries and developments. And so at least one day, the doorway might be opened and the messages delivered. They will have their profit. At dusk, a lone tradesman, Mukhlis, journeyed home along his trade route to Masiaf. The assassins used to protect all of Masiaf's surrounding routes, but in the decades past, bandits seized upon tradesmen, decorating the desert with their guts, and Mukhlis had no immunity. Bayhas, the young bandit leader, instructed his men to beat and then tie Mukhlis upside down from a tree. He and his men laughed as they prepared to spill his guts from his body, as they had done to the last dozen traders, until an aged voice rasped out, cut him down, and who might you be to demand this of me? An archer reached for his bow, only a second too late. As Bayhas and another brigand stood watching in amazement, Altair cut through another bandit. They're all soon wore off, and by extension, Altair's advantage. Skilled as he once was, this was a man of 82 years, outnumbered by men decades his junior. The young man who danced through hordes of Templar knights in Jerusalem would have finished this in seconds, but Altair had left his fighting instincts neglected for two decades now. That space had long been reoccupied occupied with grief and sorrow. Bayhas had worn Altair down, kneeling and breathing what felt like his final breaths. Mukhlis, having had the time to free himself, took hold of Bayhas, allowing for Altair to use the last of his energy, plunging his blade into Bayhas's stomach. Mukhlis laid Altair to rest in his and his wife's bed, in his Masiaf home. Altair would lie unconscious as Mukhlis recounted his day, hoping to stimulate the brain of his elderly patient into consciousness. Mukhlis detailed today's events. Fahad, father of Bayhas, wanted vengeance for his son, and would soon be travelling to Masiaf to expose and kill the perpetrator. Abbas has his price, it seems. Master Altair would have died rather than allow such a thing. The Master, Altair ibn Laahad. It is you, isn't it? You're him. You're Altair. Mukhlis fell to Altair's feet, grabbing an old, tired hand. Finally, Masiaf was going to be saved. The assassins had said that Altair had died, that after the death of Maria, he had thrown himself from the citadel tower and died. Regrettably, Mukhlis had made Altair's presence known. He had told villagers that the legendary Altair had saved him and cleansed the region of a violent pest. And to his surprise, the people hadn't given Altair up. They were thankful that their leader was back. When a reward was offered in exchange for Bayhas's killer, the village declined. Mukhlis was right. Masiaf needed saving. 
it needed Altair. In the years past, Masiaf had fell victim to Abbas's corruption. Abbas imposed the village with fierce taxes, giving nothing in return. Even protection, which was a guarantee in the era of Altair or Al Mualim, was surrendered to brigands such as Fahad for the right price. The greatest corruption, though, was a spiritual one. There was no community left to speak of. The assassins didn't provide Masiaf with guidance or strength, but paranoia, fear, hopelessness. After Altair left, a group of assassins loyal to him, Malik, and the tenets of the Brotherhood staged an uprising. Its instigators were killed and made examples, and since then Abbas feared a second uprising. He spent day and night in his tower, snuffing out plots against him that never even existed, answering any dissent, real or imagined, with death. Altair meant to set things right, not with steel or with pointed lies, but with the Creed's example. He intervened in fights, neighborly disputes, and lovers' quarrels. Over the next few days, Altair gleaned a shadowy figure stalking him and staying out of sight. He moved like an assassin too. After all, it was only a matter of time until Abbas heard word of Altair's return. But it turned out this wasn't an assassin, or not an assassin of Abbas's ilk, at least. It was Malik's son. As soon as he had pulled down his hood, Altair immediately recognized him. Though he hadn't seen the boy since he was a newborn, years ago, he would recognize Malik's eyes anywhere. Malik inherited not only his father's name, but his dedication to the Creed. He'd gathered a group of assassins loyal to the cause who would stand up against the Bass alongside Altair, who already was practically Grand Master of Masiaf's village. And so the next morning, Mukhlis and his family called upon the village going door to door calling upon the resistance. Malik claimed that there were, at minimum, 20 assassins who would stand with them, which, in addition to the townsfolk, would surely be enough to overthrow the 30 or 40 men still loyal to Abbas. Before marching on the castle, Altair gathered his resistance and spoke. What we will not do is welcome our dawn through a veil of assassin blood. Those who remain loyal to Abbas are our enemies today, but tomorrow they will be our companions. Their friendship can only be won if our victory is merciful. Kill only if it is absolutely necessary. We come to bring peace to Masiaf, not death. A group of Abbas's men were sent forward to the resistance. Before engaging, Altier repeated that there was to be no killing. A loyalist scout snarled, then you won't get far, old man. He jolted forward sword first. Altair simply spun around the attack, drew his sword, and held the loyalist from behind. There will be no killing in the name of this old man. Altair threw the loyalist to Malik, who incapacitated him. The few others in his party came forward with much less eagerness, and soon they were all unconscious or captive. Further up the hill, more loyalists stood in their way. As battle unfolded, Altair gazed at the ramparts, where Malik stood with his archers. The two regarded each other briefly, before Abbas called on his hesitant and archers to fire. Altair declared once more that there was no need for death, hoping to God that Abbas's archers were decent enough to listen. As a loyalist cut open the throat of a rebel and began approaching another, Altair beckoned Malik. Him. Take him, Malik. Malik swiped at his legs and knocked him unconscious with his sword's hilt, and with that, two archers lowered their bows, shook their heads, and resigned from Abbas's cause. Even as he waved his knife, his father's knife, at the archers, they wouldn't budge. As Abbas screamed at his remaining archers to cut down the defectors, one by one his men laid down their weapons, clearing the way for the resistance to march on the castle. Altair entered, equipped with the latest design the apple had conjured. He had promised himself never to take pleasure in death again. Even Abbas, who was responsible for the deaths of his wife, son, brother, and the very order he had given his life to, he refused to regress again. Tell your men to stand down. No, I am defending Masyaf. Would you not do the same? You corrupted everything we stand for and lost everything we gained. All of it sacrificed on the altar of your own spite. And you, you have wasted your life staring into that apple. Dreaming of your own glory. That is true, Abbas. I learned many things from the Apple. Of life and death. Of the past and the future. Let me show you. I can never forgive you, Altair. The lies you told about my family, my father, the humiliation I suffered. They were not lies, Abbas. I was ten years old when your father came to see me. He was in tears, begging to be forgiven for betraying my family. 
Then he cut his own throat. I watched his life ebb away at my feet. I will never forget that image. No! But he was not a coward, Abbas. He reclaimed his honor. I hope there is another life after this one. Then I will see him and know the truth of his final days. And when it is your time, we will find you. And then there will be no doubts. Two days later, Fahad rode into Masyaf with some of his men, tired and seeking his son's killer. Altair was amicable and diplomatic. He told Fahad that it was him who had killed Bayhas, and that really, it didn't matter anymore. He told Fahad of how he had lost his own son, and because of it, he had nearly lost his people. If the two communities fought, both would be devastated, perhaps beyond repair. Fahad remarked that Altair had a much wiser head than his predecessor, and rode home. In the years following, Altair ensured that his learnings were passed to the Brotherhood. A library was built beneath Masia housing the hundreds of books Altier had written with the aid of the apple. Soon I shall pass from this world. It is my time. All the hours of the day are now coloured by the thoughts and fears born of this realisation. I know that the elements of my body will return to the earth, but what of my consciousness? My identity? That is to say, what of me? I suspect it will end, that there is no next world, nor a return to this one. It will simply be done, forever. Our lives are so brief and unimportant, the cosmos cares nothing for us, for what we've done. Had we wrought evil instead of good, had I chosen to abuse the apple instead of seal it away, none of it would have mattered. There is no counting, no reckoning, no final judgment. There is simply silence and darkness, utter and absolute. And so I've begun to wonder, might there not be a way to stop or at least delay death's embrace? Surely the ones who came before were not so frail and feeble as we. But I have sworn to be done with the artifact, to not gaze into its core. Still, faced as I am with the prospect of my end, what harm is there in one last look? In Altair's final months, Darum sent for the Venetian explorers Niccolo and Maffeo Polo. Altair would sit with Niccolo for hours, detailing his life as an assassin as Niccolo wrote what would become The Secret Crusade, a journal that Niccolo would pass on to his son, Marco. Both Polos were initiated into the Brotherhood during their stay at Masyaf. It was their mission to begin an Ottoman guild of assassins in Constantinople, helping make Altair's vision of a worldwide Brotherhood not centralised to Masyaf a reality. Every assassin now evacuated Masyaf many headed west of the Holy Land. Nicola Polo, our time together was brief, I know. But I have faith this Codex will answer the many questions yet to ask. Altair, this gift is invaluable. Grazie. So, where will you go next? Back to Constantinople for a time. We will establish a guild there before returning to Venezia. Your son Marco will be eager to hear his father's wild stories. He is a little young for such tales, but one day soon, see? Father, a vanguard of Mongols has broken through. The village is overrun. Nicolo, your cargo and provisions are waiting for you by the village gates. We will escort you there. Thank you. Due to an incoming Mongol siege, both Polos were forced to leave. Altair escorted the brothers to safety, using the apple, which he now had total mastery with, to deal with any Mongol who posed a threat. Father, are you hurt? Ah, uh, give me a moment. <clears throat> ah, the end of an era. When I was very young, I was foolish enough to believe that our creed would bring an end to all these conflicts. If only I possessed the humility to say to myself, I have seen enough for one life. I have done my part. Then again, there is no greater glory than fighting to find the truth. We are ready. A last favor, Niccolo. Take these with you and guard them well. Hide them if you must. Artifacts? Of a kind. They are keys. Each one imbued with a message. A message? For whom? I wish I knew. With the exception of Darum and Altair, 
Masiaf was now completely abandoned, and so the two convened one final time and said their goodbyes. You have seen to my books? Yes. Some we sent with the Polos. The rest will go with me to Alexandria. Good. Very good. Father, I do not understand. Why did you build a library if you did not intend to keep your books? You should go. When the Mongols return, Masyaf must be empty. I see. This is not a library at all. It is a vault. It must stay hidden, Darim. Far from eager hands. At least until it has passed on the secret it contains. What secret? Go, son. Go be with your family. And live well. All that is good in me began with you, father. Wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge, increaseth sorrow. What does it tell you? What do you see? Strange visions and messages of ones who came before, of their rise and their fall. But what happens to us, Altair? To our family? What does the apple say? before. What brought them here? How long ago? Get rid of that thing! This is my duty, Maria. <clears throat> if you are asked, say I sent the apple away. Tell them I sent it to Cyprus or Sipango or that I dropped it into the sea. Tell them anything to keep men away from this place. This apple must not be found. Not until the time is right. Wisdom. Just you, fratello mio. So now for some of the differences between the Secret Crusade and the games it's based on. Generally speaking, Secret Crusade is very loyal to the source material, barring some revelation stuff. To my memory, it has the least deviation of at least a few AC novels that I've read at this point, with one of the bigger differences being structuring, specifically the order that targets are assassinated in. William is assassinated before a bull, just as Jubair is assassinated before Sibrand, whereas in AC1, that's the other way around. On the topic of Sibrand, he's described as having black hair in the novelization, which is such a weird small change that I can't really figure out. Even in concept art of Sibrand, he is blonde, and so this feels like an odd change that was most likely intentional, as the rest of the book is so accurate. If, if anyone can figure out exactly what Bowden was going for here, then drop a comment. Generally, the biggest narrative advantage the book has over the game is, like you'd expect, you have a continuous look into Altair's headspace. I'd say this would have the biggest effect on how you, you know, play these games in the first 
I'd say 50 or so pages after the Temple of Solomon. This is when Altair is at his most depressed and valueless. The log trap in the game is a thing that Altair has to be told about, but the Secret Crusade elaborates on this. Bowne really digs deep into the doubts that Altair has about Al Walim's love for him. Uh, he starts to ponder what else he hasn't told him and what that says about their relationship. That to Al Walim is just kind of a practicality, which of course becomes more and more obvious. And this one isn't a difference, but it is interesting to me. After this, Altair is stabbed, or he thinks that he's stabbed. Al Walim explains that he only made Altair feel death's embrace, as he puts it. And this is something that I did think the novel would elaborate on, especially as I vaguely remember this being a topic of contention at at least about nine or ten years ago, and so it probably was back when Secret Crusade was actually being written. And that's why Altair is totally susceptible to the apple here, but not at the very end of the game or when Al Mulim tries to use it in that one dialogue. And the only real answer you'd be left to assume is a psychological one. That Altair isn't affected by the apple later on because he's more mentally resilient and so less susceptible to the manipulation of Al Mualim, who Altair is completely submissive to at the time he's stabbed, which would track, because in AC1, having or not having Isu DNA isn't even a factor, at least it wasn't introduced back then. The apple, as is said a few times by Altair and Al Mualim, is temptation itself, and so it capitalizes on those with weaker wills. And so it would make sense that Altair builds resistance over the course of his arc, because Malik, who is the most sort of noble character in AC1, is also unaffected. That's sort of been a headcanon of mine for a while though, I'm not entirely sure. After this in the game, you're sent after Masoon, the traitor who opened the gates for the Templars, and both Masoon and Jamal, as minor as they are, are completely omitted from the Secret Crusade, which makes a lot of sense as they serve mainly as tutorial on how investigations work. In the novel, Garnier has this soldier, Lazy Eye, who in the game would be this guy, or this guy, with just an indistinct character model. Lazy Eye is one of the soldiers Garnier converts with mind control, and he has to warn him a few times to be less rough with patients. He stands in Altair's way as he's escaping the hospital, which he deals with by swerving to the side of his impaired eye, and then just slashing his throat. In terms of other stuff, William retreats to his quarters in the Secret Crusade. In AC1, he remains in the square. In the Secret Crusade, a bull has his servants wheel out wine in caskets. In the game, it's a fountain. As you can probably tell, a lot of these minor changes were made likely because they make a little more narrative sense that AC1 just didn't really have room for in development. And a fairly big one that is quite noticeable because it's silly is in the game Robert's entire guard fight alongside him, despite Richard calling for what would only make sense as a one-on-one. -on -one. When Altair kills Al Mualim, in the Secret Crusade he picks up the apple and he sees images of the Toba catastrophe, and basically the history of the world, the past, and I suppose the potential future of the human race. Whereas in the game it's just the map that's omitted, because I suppose all that stuff wouldn't really have a place in AC1. And while the solar flare did of course exist in AC1, its introduction on top of everything else at the end of the game would have just been kind of messy. Then you've got the Bloodline stuff, which is easily the weakest part of the book. Although it has a stronger sense of narrative and direction than LTS Chronicles, it's still quite video gaming, unavoidably so. This is something that Bowden navigates really well in the AC1 section. He even describes specific free running and combat mechanics in the game in a really organic way, whereas a lot of this part of the book is just introducing a new target or thing and then killing them, which is especially weird and polarizing with the Dark Oracle stuff, which comes out of nowhere. But that's, that's less the fault of him and more the game that he had to adapt, which I, I do quite like generally. But yeah, there are some differences. Mainly, The Secret Crusade expands on some of the conversations from the game. That really great conversation with Maria that will be in this video as a cutscene is quite a bit longer. The dialogue I described about Maria's life as a lady of the house isn't there at all. It begins with the philosophy talk and even that is expanded upon a lot in the book. And this isn't some Bloodlines bad narrative. I do quite like the game and its story, especially given its limitations, but Bowden is just able to expand on a lot of things without said limitations. Altair does actually write, I think, three codex pages in Bloodlines, and I would have included those in place of my depressive fucking tones, 
but they're all cut very short. A lot of these are just excerpts, basically, and they miss a lot of key stuff included in that page, whether that was because Jeffrey O'Harlem hadn't finished writing the codex yet, or more likely because the game just didn't have the room for it, I don't know. Besides that though, it's pretty similar. In Revelations, there is a few significant differences. For one, this guy is Swami, and his death in Revelations is fairly tame, relatively, compared to the novel, where his mouth is glowing gold and he's ripping his face apart. I think, I think Bound says he's tearing trenches into his face or something like that. Then after Maria dies, Altair leaps through the main big glass window and escapes with Darren. Whereas in the Secret Crusade, their chase is a lot more dramatic. Altair is bleeding out and there's this really poignant moment where Altair leaps from the Citadel one last time. I mean, thinking about it, that whole memory is different. There's no dead Malik, Abbas doesn't hold Maria at knife point, and there's no crowd. Both Abbas and Altair are trying to win their favour, and Abbas is trying to get Altair to do just something really stupid publicly. Also, Swami doesn't stab Maria intentionally, as he seems to in-game. He's just slashing at himself, wildly, and he catches her throat. And speaking of revelations, that memory centred around Harris, the assassin traitor, isn't included, although it is referenced. The book jumps from Umar's death to the beginning of AC1, and all, all of the Abbas stuff is just added in various flashbacks. I imagine this wasn't included as the book was already just shy of 500 pages without it, and it wasn't really crucial to this story, whereas it has much more place as a part of Ezio's in Revelations. And I think the only other major difference is just its structuring. The book is structured like the in-universe Secret Crusade, or it's more like Niccolo reading from the Secret Crusade to Maffeo. Intermittently, you have segments from 1257 from Niccolo's point of view, and everything you're told about Altair is from his perspective. He's telling Maffeo all of these stories that you would assume are just excerpts from his journal. It's pretty cool, I, I like it a lot. Because of that, naturally, you don't have that final scene with Altair and Darren. Uh, nothing about the Masiaf keys is disclosed in the book either, at least in terms of their purpose. Niccolo isn't told, so neither are we. It was actually a pretty clever way of keeping, I guess, the revelations of AC Revelations under wraps. Secret Crusade dropped way back in the summer of 2011, so there had to be some way of dodging that stuff without compromising on the story and still being able to find these things out for the first time with Ezio. Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If if you are still here, let me know what you thought of this because I would really like to do every book. My difficulty is just editing around scenes that are slightly different in the book or not there, and so I'd really appreciate any feedback so I can kind of get this format down by the time we reach, you know, Brotherhood or Revelations. Anyway, leave a like if you enjoyed, and if you didn't, maybe let me know why. Thanks again, you guys, and I'll see you around.